assumptions on getting 12 as a slope. So what do I need to make a line? I got a slope. That's part of a line. It's about half the information you need for a line. What's the other information you need for a line? So we either need a, we basically need a point. So it could be a y-intercept, which is a point on the y-axis, or it could be any point. And I didn't directly give you a point here. How do we, let's zoom in on the actual problem. So the actual problem I'll underline right here. How do I get a point out of this? I have a function and an x value. Yep, all we have to do is take that x, turn it into a f of x value or a y value. So I need to turn this function and x value into a point. So we're going to plug in x equals 2 to f. So take 2 and f it, and we get 2 cubed, which is 8. So our point on the graph could be written as x comma f of x, which was 2 f of 2 which we computed was 2, 8. So we just took our x coordinate and got our, and our function got our y coordinate. So we have 2, 8. And now we can put both of these together. And this comes from, I use the second form because it's basically one step closer to the form I wanted. So I just subtract the y1 to the other side. So I'm just solving for y. So I'm going to use this form. This is one of my favorite forms right here for this class. This also is exactly linear linearization when we get there in chapter 3. So if you use this form, you'll be one step closer to what we're going to do in chapter 3 also. So I don't know if this really has a name. They give names to, they just divide by x minus x1 and give it a new name. I don't think it's worth naming new equations based off one simple algebraic operation. So this is the linear equation that I'm going to use. We got 12. That's on the screen right there. That's our m. Scroll up a tiny bit. We got 2. Make sure you plug in the x for the x and the y for the y. You can absolutely leave it in this form. If you really want to write it as mx plus b, we have minus 24 plus 8 is something negative 16. They have 12x minus 16. I think we graphed this yesterday. Oh, so I had you find the y-intercept, and then I graphed it, but I didn't show you how I found the y-intercept. OK. Oh, I think I just took the y-intercept off one of you guys, and it worked. <laughs> All right, so there's the y-intercept, or the if you want to leave it in whatever form that is, your x, y point you, cr you cross through. Web work will take any of these forms. I'll take any of these forms. It doesn't matter. As long as I can read your slope and either your y-intercept or the values you plugged in. So I'm going to go ahead and circle that one as my final answer. And we're going to go to the next section now. So I just opened up 2.1 on web work for homework. And today's Wednesday, so a good Friday quiz will be 2.1. So we just finished 2.1. And if I give you a quiz tomorrow, it'll, be, it'll have to be on 1.3 and before. So really high chance there's trig on your quiz either way. So we're into 2.2, which is limit of a function and limit laws. And we're going to spend a long time in 2.2 and then go through the other sections much faster. So we'll do a lot of the uh, developing our knowledge in 2.2 and then apply it relatively quickly in the other sections. So before we talk about limits, let's look at how does this function, and the function will be x squared minus 1 over x minus 1, behave. 
near but not at x equals 1. So this idea of near but not at x equals 1. Well, x equals 1 is an interesting value. What significance does x equals 1 have in this particular function? What does plugging in 1 So we'd be undefined. So you actually can't plug in 0, or can't plug in 1. You'll be divided by 0. Can I plug in values close to 1? No problem. I won't be divided by 0, so I can plug in a number that's basically not 1. Let's do a little bit of algebra on f and try to simplify it. How do I factor x squared minus 1? And you could look at this as a difference of squares. So a difference of squares, also known as conjugates. Well, two conjugates multiplied together. So we're using this algebraic property. It's called difference of squares or conjugates. So I see x squared minus 1 squared, which factors x minus 1, x plus 1 into its conjugates. What can I cancel here? The x minus 1, x minus 1 is going to cancel out. So we get x plus 1. Now, this equal sign is a little bit tricky. Is it really equal? So one minute ago, we just said you can't plug in x equals 1. Can I plug in x equals 1 on the right side? Yes, I get 2. So it's not actually equal for all x values, is it? It's equal for all x values that are not 1. So anytime x is not 1, these are equal. So this equal sign, I have to also write and x is not 1. So on the right side, I lose the information or the fact that x cannot equal 1. I would get undefined. But all the other x values, it's equal for. Can you graph x plus 1, f of x equals x plus 1? Go ahead and graph that out. And what we're going to do is basically cut out that one point that we're not allowed to have in the graph. So go ahead and graph x plus 1. Easy to graph. And we're going to cut out, we're going to put a hole in the graph at x equals 1. So the way we graph a function with a hole that we're going to cut in it is just put a basically empty dot to signify that we cut that point out right there. So there's our remove point. So here's our graph. And this is the graph of x plus 1 when x is not 1. So we just took that one point out. So let's look at our original question for this section. How does this function behave near but not at x equals 1? So how does it behave? It behaves very nicely. As long as you don't let x equal 1, it behaves just like that x plus 1 function. So we can answer this question now. So 
but not at, I'm not going to keep writing that down. I'm just going to say near. So near x equals 1, it behaves just like that x plus 1 function that we saw. So let's look at, let's make a table of values close to x equals 1. So we'll go x values here. We'll do the smaller ones on the top. We'll go 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 0 0.9999. One is undefined, so I'm going to just write undefined right there. And then after one, we'll write some small values, 1.001, 1.01, 1.1. 1 so I'm just going by basically 10 times closer to one each time. So I just wrote these dots down. If you kept going and put 0.9999999, eventually you'll get closer and closer to one. So we can easily uh, plug in. I chose an easy function, so all you have to do is add one to all these x values. It's very easy to plug these in. 1.9, 1.99, 1.999, 1.1, 1.1. Not allowed to plug in one, but we'll plug in everything bigger than one on this table. 2.001, 2.01, And of course, I could have plugged in closer x values. I chose the easy pattern, so it would be easy to see what I would plug in to get even closer. I just, down here, just go 1.001 and just add another 9 in the other side. So let's look at this undefined. What if you don't actually think about this x value, what pattern are we actually approaching here on either side? So let's erase this undefined, pretend like it's not there. We're not really allowed to plug that in. Just look at the pattern. What number are we approaching on the right column? Two. Two. So if we're going on the smaller side, we're getting very close to 2. And if we're going on the bigger side, we're getting very close to 2. And we can do all this without actually plugging in 1. We're not allowed to plug in 1. We're just looking at what happens when things are very close. So we're getting very close to 2. So this idea, we looked at it on a table with numbers. We looked at it on a graph. If we zoom in on the graph now, what happens when x gets very close to 1? What does y get close to on the graph? 2, either side. You can see that happening. Just think about you're on that line. You're going closer to, your x value is getting closer to 1. So your y value is getting closer to 2. So you can see it on the graph. You can see it in a table. So how do we write this out? We call this uh, pattern, or this uh, y value is approaching a certain y value. We call this a limit. And the way we write it, we use lim. I'll go back to the black marker now. So we approached 1. The function was f of x, and we said, either way, you should be getting close to a y value of 2. So this y value 2 right here, that's the one that we are approaching either way. You can write as a note in your limit it doesn't matter what happens when x equals 1 in your limit. It doesn't matter. The idea is when x is getting close to, but not equal. 
So this idea of behave near, but not at. So what happens when you get close to that number? We will write the precise definition of a limit, but this will be the, uh, what it means in a easier to understand English definition. Well, I should say the limit. So the limit of f of x as x approaches a is the y value that f of x approaches as x approaches a. You could write it as x approaches a, f of x approaches, and we'll use a letter capital L. So it says as x approaches a, f of x approaches L. And this does not mean f of a equals L. So it has nothing to do with being able to plug a in and getting that y value out. So our function, we weren't allowed to plug in one, but we still got two as our limit. We will talk about continuity soon, which is basically you can draw your graph and it has no holes in it. That's a very basic definition for continuity, or a basic way to think about continuity. The graph we just drew has a hole in it, so it's not continuous. There's two distinct pieces. Uh, so this function is not continuous because there's a hole in the graph. But we won't worry about that definition for a little while. We'll talk about limits some more. And let's look at some easy functions and their limits. So what functions are special? We'll look at the constant function first. So if f of x equals c, constant, So our function f of x equals c, so I can just substitute in c, where I see f of x. And let's look at a graph to get some intuition. So what does a graph of f of x equals c look like? Some function is equal to a number. It's not very exciting, but it does have a graph. Remember, f of x you could write as y, so our function is, our graph is y equals c. It's a line. You can write it as 0x plus c if you want to. So we have a horizontal slope, or horizontal line, a zero slope. So we'll go up and graph it now. So it's kind of boring, y equals c. Your y value is always c. So what y value are you getting close to, no matter what x value you're looking at? C. C. You don't need too much brain power. No matter where you are on the horizontal line, your y value is very close to C. In fact, it is C. So a constant function limit, no matter what x value you approach, is always C. That's what we'll put in a box to memorize right there. So limit of a constant is always just c. Doesn't depend on the x value. And just goes off that horizontal line graph right there. So our next easy special function is the identity function. Let's 
just call the identity. Yep, that's right. So we graph this function. And let's say A is positive. So I just put A over there on the positive side. What Y value are we approaching? So if X is approaching A, what y value is up here? Our slope's one. So if we go over a, how much do we go up? A. a. Right there. So go over a, go up a. All right, let's pretend that a is negative now. So maybe a is way over here. If you go over a, it's a little weird, but if you go left A you, and your slope is 1, you're going to go down A. So you'll be here also at A. It's a little strange because A is negative. It's a little weird to see it on the negative side, but don't assume A is positive. All right, so either way, your Y value is getting close to A. The same thing as your X. So we get that equals A right there. Those are two easy special functions that we will use our limits again and again. So this next example, we're going to graph and find the limit and function value. So I want to find limit as x approaches 0 of f of x. And what is f of 0 when? So the first one we'll do f of x equals, so it's going to be a step function, 0 or 1. 0 when x less than 0, 1 when x greater than or equal to 0. So this is a step function. Go ahead and graph it out. Be a little careful when x equals 0, which of those two dots that you fill in. Make sure you fill in the correct dot. So let's start with the easier question. What is f of 0? You can figure that out without a graph. You can look at the step function. Are we in piece 1 or piece 2 when x equals 0? So we have that property. So when x is 0, we're on piece 2, and our y value is 1. Now what about the limit? So limit, what y value are we approaching? Or does it depend on what side you approach on? So it looks like we're approaching 0 and 1, depending on which way we look. So because there's not a single value, you say this limit does not exist. So we'll abbreviate with DNE. because f is approaching more than one y value. Now, 
specifically it's because f is not approaching one y value. In this case, approaching two y values. So next function, we'll also do a step function. So f is 1 when x is not 0, and f is 2 when x is 0. So go and graph that out. And I want to know what's f of 0 and limit x approach to 0 f of x. So you can figure out x, f of 0 without a graph, but the second one will be easier with a graph. Easy question, what is f of 0? Two. 2. You're in piece 2, which happens to have the y value of 2. Now, slightly more tricky question, what is the limit as x approaches 0? So we're going to look at the graph. What y value, remember it doesn't matter what happens when x actually equals 0. So forget about that point up there. That doesn't matter. It's not relevant. What happens as x approaches 0? What is your y value? So no matter what, as long as x is not 0, we have some point on this line somewhere. Whatever your x value is, as long as it's not 0, your y value is always 1 in this function. So it doesn't matter what happens when x is 0, only matters what happens when x is near 0. So when x is close to 0, y equals 1. Your y value is always 1. So we can answer the limit question. Limit is 1. So our y, y value is close to 1 when x is approaching 0. And I'll fill that point back in because we're done answering the limit question. So this function is a little weird because it has a limit even though it doesn't match up. And we'll look at the limit laws now. So if we have two functions, f and g, and we know that the limit of f when x approaches a is l, and the limit of g as x approaches a is m, so we know these two functions separately have limits. <coughs> Let's look at the limit x approaches a, fx plus gx. So all you have to do for this limit if your two functions are added together, the limit of their sum is just the two limits separately added together. So limit of the sum is the sum of the limits. And we can just replace these by L plus M. So that's the sum law. Product is very similar.
So we're multiplying now. So it's L times M. So some product difference. And let's skip out the skip over the intermediate step. I'll just write L minus M right there. So it splits up just like addition did. Quotient. And what do you think we need to be careful about on the quotient limit that we didn't have to worry about for the other three? as long as m's not zero. If m does equal zero, sometimes the limit exists, sometimes it doesn't. You have to work a little harder to see what it actually is. But this quotient rule works whenever m's not zero, which is a quotient law. So we have a power rule. So f of x raised to the c power. We'll just write this as m to the c. Now you have to be a little careful when you take powers. For example, if you have a 1 half power and a negative number, you have an imaginary value. So I'm going to write m to the c when m to the c is a real number. So when it makes sense to take the number m to the c power. So if c is like square root, square root power, you want to make sure it's not negative. Um, another thing, if you had uh, zero to the negative first power, something like that, uh, there'll be one over zero, so that won't make sense either. So if your power is negative, you want to make sure m is not zero as well. Luckily, all this is taken care of. If m to the c is a real number, it's all taken care of with that statement. I was just telling you the two ways that it could go wrong and not be a number. And now we're going to apply these laws. We're also going to use the special limits that we wrote down earlier. So we'll start out easy. Actually, I need to fit one more limit law in here. So I'm going to do something you can't do. All right, it worked. So the last one is constant multiple. Technically, your constant multiple is actually covered by your product rule already. But we'll write this one down for completeness. So if you have a number times your function, this is c times your limit of your function. And you can think of your constant, multiplying constant is a vertical stretch, basically. So whatever y value you approached before, you just stretch it by c, and that's your new y value. Ah, so what does that mean? 
Yes. Okay. Well, it won't always be A. It might be some other letter or a number. It'll very frequently be a number in the examples you're doing. So we looked at before, I think x approached 0 or x approached 1, I think, were the values that we used above. So it won't always be A. Generally, it'll be x approaching. Sometimes when we use different quotients, we'll take a limit of h as h approaches 0. So we sort of did that yesterday, although I didn't use these words. So we basically did, we basically did limits yesterday with h approaching 0, although I didn't say that. Yep. Oh, that's not good. L. So th these two need to be L's. Yeah. So yeah, it should be the the limit of f. All right. So we're going to use these rules. Now, I said the multiple, the constant multiple rule is the same as a product rule, or it could be the product rule. Just think this function f is just a constant. So it's just c, and then you get the uh, constant multiple rule for free. And let's put an actual number in here. Let's approach, let's approach 2. All right, so what rule do I use first? I certainly see exponents. But if you were going to perform algebra, would you q uh, take a cube root first, or would you deal with the subtraction? You would go subtraction first. So when in doubt, you're generally going up that um, PEMDAS. So I'm using the difference rule. So we're going to have limit x approaches 2 of x cubed minus lim x approaches 2 of 3x squared. So what rule do I do use next on the limit of x cubed? There's only five rules. 20% chance a blind guess is correct. Oh, there's six rules. So a little less than 20% chance your guess is correct. Yep, power rule. So we've got exponent. So we're just going to cube. So we're going to rewrite it. Limit of x, x approaches 2 and then cube that limit right there. So we're going to find the inside limit and then cube that number. And over here, there's actually two things going on. There is a product, a constant multiple. And then after we deal with that, there is a square uh, or an exponent that we'll deal with. And now we can evaluate this limit of x as x approaches 2. What, is, what number is that? So that's identity limit. It's going to be 2. Minus 3. We're going to use the limit law on exponents here. So we're just going to find the limit of x and then square that. So 2 cubed is 8, minus 3 times 2 squared, 8 minus 12, negative 4 is our limit here. Uh, it is this one right here. So it's the bottom one that we used. So whenever you just have a limit of x, it's just that number that x is approaching. So the idea with these two limits are these are the sort of fundamental ones that hopefully do a few limit problems, and these will go right in your memory very easily. 
So if you're constant, you're going to have that limit. That y value is your limit. If you're the identity, just x, you're whatever x value you're approaching, that's your output also. Yes, you can, but we haven't shown that yet. So we will get to that very soon. Basically, if you have a polynomial, you can plug in your value. So we're just doing things very slowly and explicitly right now.